Hey there, I'm Tiffany Youngren, owner of OMH Agency, and welcome to Breakaway Agent. In a world full of real estate pros struggling to get ahead, there are a few who emerge and become wildly successful. If you are, or if you're working to become one of these breakaway agents, this show is for you. Thank you so much for listening. And even if you just get one thing out of this episode that helps your business grow, that is a huge win. Hopefully you'll get a few nuggets to help you move forward. Today, I'm really excited to welcome George Rosario, realtor and speaker from Ernst & George Realty Group. George L. Rosario, also known as New York City's hometown realtor, is a native New Yorker born in Williamsburg and he's lived in the three boroughs he now serves. He loves reading, dancing, and trying new foods and funny movies. Well, I'm so excited, George. Thank you so much for being part of our podcast. Could we just start out? Could you please just tell us a little bit about yourself, um, what you do, and what's gotten you to where you're at right now? Very good, very good. Uh, I, I like to always start with people letting them know the most important thing about my life. I'm a father of seven, grandfather of four. So, and I'm only 46 years old. So that's, uh, that's an awesome part of my life. It's what's actually encouraged me to go and look for new ways to be successful and to give my kids something to be proud of. Um, I grew up in Brooklyn. I love New York City. What better way to live your life than selling what you love? So I help people find their own, their own piece of love in New York City. So that's my goal, to help everybody develop a love affair with my city. That's awesome. Well, I already have one. I absolutely love New York. Um, we were talking earlier and I mentioned like, I feel like it's my mothership. Like I'm, mm-hmm. I walk faster. I conf, you know, like I'm confident outside of New York, but I just, there's just this like, da, 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 you know, it's in the air. It's in the air. Yeah. It's, it's like, if we could bottle this and take it everywhere else in the world, we'd be billionaires. It's in the air. Exactly. People just, people just feel like there's so much more to accomplish here. And it's, it's so much fun to see people, who come from other places and they come to New York and all of a sudden you see them wake up. You see them just open up and really become something amazing. That's what I love about my city. Maybe it's that if you can make it there, you can make it anywhere. Just (laughs) play in the back of my head. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But um, Well, that's awesome. And so how long have you been in the industry? I started out as a property manager in 1990. Um, I managed properties um, in Bushwick, mainly. Bushwick and Williamsburg, Brooklyn. There are areas now that everybody, you know, they see them. They're so trendy. They're the coolest places to be. They were tough in the 90s. <laughs> very, very tough in the 90s. So managing properties in that area was not easy. Uh, but then in 2008, when I saw everybody running out of the market because of the crash and everyone was just giving up their licenses and offices were emptying out, I decided, let me get my real estate license and help the people that are struggling now. I don't want New York to deal with the problems that other states are dealing with. So I wanted to help the people of my community deal with that crash. And Mm. I got my license and I'll tell you, it was the best thing I ever did. It was Uh, awesome. Just love it. Well, that's awesome. That's very cool. Well, um, I believe that everyone has strengths. So, and as a high achiever like yourself, it really speaks to the fact that you've leaned into what I call your superpowers. Um, (laughs) And I asked you before what you feel your superpowers are. And I know that one of them you said is empathy and putting yourself in your client's shoes. Would you elaborate on that for me? Absolutely. Uh, when, when I was 18 years old, uh, as a young dad, I became a dad at 18, graduated high school, became a father, started college, got married, everything in one year. Um, so when I became a dad, I was shopping for an apartment. I needed a place for my family. And uh, we were not treated with a lot of respect. First of all, we were very young. People didn't think we could afford, especially in New York, which even mm. then in 1990, it was expensive. Um, it, it was just, it, it was not the best experience. So I said, if I ever go into any service industry, I am going to treat my clients the way I would want to be treated. And I want to put myself in their shoes so that I could treat them the way they expect to be treated. And that's why I think empathy, if you can feel their feelings, you can help them get to where they want to be from where they're at. And that's Mm. the most important thing in this business. Mm. That's awesome. Well, and another thing that we talked about a little bit was like something that you're just really passionate 
about talking about, especially with maybe newer agents or agents that you're mentoring. And one of the things that you said was this, you said, do not ever pretend you know it all. The market (laughs) is fluid. It is always changing. Be flexible. Be open to change. Surround yourself with individuals that are successful and you too will be successful. After all, success leaves breadcrumbs and footprints for you to follow. How about if you tell us a little more about that? Well, um, I I see a lot of people fail in this business because they come in thinking they know everything. Mm -hmm. And uh, I I will tell you, when I got my license, I thought I knew everything. I had that piece of plastic. I'm I'm Superman. I can do whatever I want. And uh, after the very first deal, I found out I didn't know anything yet. Mm -hmm. And I had a lot to learn. Uh, The the good thing is that I, I came into this industry willing to learn. And if you can do that in any, I don't care if it's just real estate, any business, any industry you're in, if you can go in with the willingness to learn, you will be able to grow. I get this from my grandmother. Um, I always tell this story because I love my grandma. I was a grandma's boy and a mama's boy. Um, So my grandmother lived to be 106 and she always told us never stop learning. And that was one of her main things. Just don't stop learning, continue learning. Uh, she wanted to have another 106 years to continue learning even more. By the way, it's a woman who, she's a woman who never went to, to any school, never enrolled even to kindergarten, and she made it. She made it, and she was a tough grandma to 52 grandkids and plenty of great grandkids. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So she was a tough, she has 17 kids. Oh so my. she was a tough, tough woman, but oh, like her she's... own self, like she just yeah. like had yeah. seventeen kids. Yeah. Wow, yeah. girl, that's yeah. Awesome. yeah. yeah. <laughs> that and, is and, remarkable. And she was four foot eleven, so oh. <laughs> was a tiny little tiny she bundle was, of power. <laughs> she was the toughest woman I ever met. Seriously, mm-hmm. like we all walked the straight line around her. But she told us, she always told us, keep learning. She spoke three languages. She read them, wrote them. Um, she never went to school for that. It's just, she wanted to continue learning and she, mm. she made sure she, she explained to us life is too short and you're not going to have enough time to learn everything you want to learn. So learn every day. Mm. So it was a, a great lesson from her. Yeah. Yeah. I always, I just totally believe in just learning as a lifestyle, you know, versus totally. just, I mean, there's a place for formal education, but I know when my kids were growing up, it was, it was just so, I, I'm, I cared less about, I was just, wasn't one of those moms who were like on them about grades all the time. Mm-hmm. I wanted them to love learning. Well, I think that's really great about your grandma. I still, I feel like I could just hear about that all day. Oh, and she's I awesome. think learning is just amazing. So I also really like that you're so committed to growth, even as a high-performing agent. What are one or two things that you struggle with today when it comes to growing sales? <laughs> the phone, the phone, the phone. I, I'm not, I'm not a fan of the phone. I'm not a fan of cold calling, and I'm not a fan of the fact that we get so many sales calls ourselves. Mm. I think that's why I don't like the cold calling part. Yeah. We get so many phone calls, people trying to sell us this service, that service, this app, that app. It's just crazy uh, that it scares me that I'm doing the same thing to other people, <laughs> right. and I don't like to be that. I, I like to be liked by everybody. But, um, yeah, the phones are very, very tough. But seeing how important they are to our growth, especially as a team leader, how how important it is to actually reach out and speak to people, I've been focusing a lot more on it. Plus, my accountability partner, Luis Lopez, he's always (laughs) poking me on the forehead, asking me if if I called A, B, or C. So he's making sure I call the people I'm supposed to call. Uh, That's... That's um that's a big one. One other thing I know a lot of agents struggle with are these discount brokerages and, oh. and things like that. And mm-hmm. um and so a lot of times we hear of, you know, it's really an important time to understand your positioning and your messaging. What are some things that you and your team uh have as kind of messages that help position you ahead of those competitors that, um, you know, we all are thrown in our side. Okay. So we do trainings every Thursday evenings and every Saturday mornings in our office. That's some, that's one thing we believe a lot in constant training, including myself. I'm always training. Lewis will give a training. We invite outside speakers. So anyway, two weeks ago, we gave a training on that. And the uh, training was on how to address that issue. When you're in front of people, what is it that you're going to put out there? 
Um, and we constantly hear that thing about, you know, this person will do it for 2%. That person will do it for a flat fee. Uh, all these online brokerages that don't make sense because they've never seen your home. They don't know your situation. They didn't actually sit down and meet the person behind the house. Mm -hmm. So I like to explain to our, our clients that we don't sell houses for a living. And that's important. For, that's a shock. When I'm yeah. at a listing appointment and I tell a person, well, my job is not to sell your house. <laughs> and they, yeah, they're, they're, what do you mean? And I said, my job is to relieve your stress while the house is being sold, to manage everything that you need to do, to make sure that you're not giving up your life in order to sell this home. Because everybody has a full-time job. Mm -hmm. Everyone has things going on in their life. My only full-time job is to sell homes, to manage your stress, to help you get from where you are to where you want to be. So when we convey that, that's number one. Number two is I love to carry information from other people who are, especially these discount brokerages, who are reaching out to us, sending us emails, calling us, sending us texts, asking us for advice on how to get something done. <laughs> so I will carry that to a listing appointment and I'll say, well, really, you, you want to go with this person? Well, there's here's 10 recruiting letters from their boss who is begging me to go work for them because we know what we're doing. So when you convey them that you actually know what you're doing and you're worth what you, you what you expect to get paid. Believe it or not, the people that are serious about selling the homes will appreciate it and you will never lose business. It's just yeah. tough. It's tough to get to that point because they, you have to build that trust first. Mm -hmm. It's not. Well, and the fact, the fact of the matter too is, is like if you're selling someone's house, once there's an offer, like that's when the work starts, you know? Oh, yes. I mean, it's not just mm -hmm. about, I mean, yeah, you can sell it and yeah, other people can too, but it's like getting it from there, like, it's almost like you're selling, would you like your house to close? You know? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Without, yes. you know, trying and to- And I'll give them, I'll give it, uh, by the way, I'm sitting on the main floor and there's a big wind in front of us. So if you see me waving, all the neighbors wave. I don't want to be rude to them. So I'm waving at everybody. They know us in the neighborhood. So we, we're, everybody's friendly here. That's uh, fantastic. We're, actually, we're across the street from the fire department. They all pass by and wave. Um, so- <laughs> So yes, when, when you're, when you're there and you're explaining to the person that it's not just to get your house with an accepted offer and into contract, things can fall apart after contract if you're not paying attention. The king, the king, king, king of follow-up in our, in our team, in our office is Luis Lopez. Uh, again, I keep going back to him because this guy is the king of, uh, of follow-up. He will make sure that the deal is flowing. He will make sure that he's in contact with everybody. He speaks to everyone down to the children of, of the sellers and buyers. He wants to know everything that's going on. And he says he's a control freak. I think he's just he's a perfectionist. He makes, it, he makes the deal flow. But I will tell you, I, I love to, when I'm in a listing uh, appointment uh, or a listing consultation and I'm speaking to the person and they're telling me, oh, yes, but, you know, once the house is in contract, what else are you going to do? <laughs> I, I like to tell them about this one deal. We have, we have a deal that's been in contract for three months. It's an old cash deal. Should have closed in what? 17 days in New York, but issues came up, mm. you know, a death certificate over there and uncooperative family member, all these different things. And we've had to manage that stress, helping these people not worry about that. So they can get to the next step, which was getting a family member to where that family member needed to be because of mm -hmm. different situations. When I bring stories like that up, all of a sudden they say, okay, so it's not just, you know, slap a sign, get a contract and we're done. And, and we start talking about all those things. It does, it's relieving their stress at the listing table. Mm -hmm. And people don't realize that. If you start, re you start relieving stress the moment that they, they make eye contact with you. And if you can't start relieving stress right there, you're not going to get the listing. So yeah. that's it. That's what yeah. we do. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, if you think about agents that you've mentored in the past or those that you like right now are mentoring, if you could just, I always say, if you're the boss of the world, you could just make them do anything. What are three things that you would make sure that they do? <laughs> follow up. Number one, follow up. Follow up. People, people leave so much money on the table and they leave so many people out on the cold uh, simply because they don't follow up. Mm. They don't pick up the phone like I don't like to do. <laughs> pick up the phone, make a phone call, send a text, send an email, make sure that you know what's going on. Follow up is key. Um, number two is don't be a secret agent. Like put yourself out there. 
Mm. The game has changed. The game has completely changed. Uh, in 2008, I saw it happening. I'm going to really age myself. Uh, the broker told me, don't go on social media. And I went on MySpace. <laughs> and I was talking about real estate yep. on MySpace. And he goes, no one on MySpace is ever going to buy a house. I don't care. I'm putting myself out there. I want everybody to know that I am in this business. So don't be a secret agent. Let everybody know. Don't make your, face, your, your pages private. If you want to separate personal and private, then have a business page. But put some personal stuff. Let them know that you like to jog or that you mm. like the Mets. I'm a Met fan. I'm not a Met okay. fan. That you like the Mets. Know that you follow this team or that team. Let them know something about yourself because it makes that connection and it makes you real rather people than being like, robotic. Yeah, people yeah. like to work with people, you know? <laughs> yes, yes. So one, one is follow-up. Two is don't be a secret agent. And number three is make sure that you present yourself the right way. Mm. This is people's biggest. And for some people, this is the biggest purchase or sale of their entire life. Right. You don't want to show up to this looking like uh, you're about to go play basketball in a park. <laughs> uh, you know, treat this treat this industry with respect. You're getting a big, big payout at the end of this deal, you know? And yet people are just showing, looking so unprofessional, not prepared, showing up late. Uh, treat this with a lot of respect. Your Your image starts the moment that they look at you. Mm. And if you can show up to to a, a, a listing appointment and they open the door and there's six agents there and five of them look like they're about to go to a party or to the swimming pool and you look like a true professional, chances are that they already trust you more than they trust them, which is why we have a dress code in this office. We, we do, our team has a dress code. And, and even the ones that didn't want to do it, the moment they went on their first appointment, they said, wow, it works because it <laughs> really does work. Be prepared, be on time and really present yourself professionally. That's what we are. You have a license, be a professional. So yeah. those are the three. Okay, very good. Very good. Um, what is something that you would tell your rookie self today? So if you're entering into real estate right now, what would you tell? go back and tell your rookie self? Have more fun. Okay. <laughs> Have more. This is this is build relationships and don't dwell on on the deal that falls apart. Mm. And and that's uh, there's something in in this industry that we call the curse of the first, and it it ends up being that the first deal is this headache and things go wrong and it's the deal that will make you or break you. And a lot of agents quit after the first deal falls apart. Mm. So if I could go back in time to my the very first deal, the very beginning, I would tell myself, have more fun, make relationships count, um, and and don't focus on the negative. You know, because there's a lot of negative in this business. There is. Yeah. Uh, you know, people, people, you're you're helping people with their problems, with their purchases, with their stress, with you're managing so much that there's negative. If you focus more on the positive, which is something. The moment I started doing that more, my, my business completely shifted. It completely changed. Mm. I just, I say, you know, brush your shoulders off before you walk in the door. Make sure you dust all that negativity off, come in positive to the office. It changes. So if I could go back, that's what I would tell myself. Have more fun. Don't take it so serious. It's build those relationships and, mm. and don't dwell on the negative. Awesome. I think that's great advice, actually. Yeah. Um, so is there a ritual or something that you have that you do daily that kind of sets you up that you feel like helps make you more successful and productive or efficient or not even productive, but improves your life? So a ritual that, that really, that really um, helps me in my business. Um, well, first of all, I, I only sleep five hours a day, but I don't recommend that for anybody. I go to sleep at midnight. I'm up at five, even when I'm on vacation. That's something that I've been doing since I was 14. Oh, wow. Um, and that's because the trains are, were horrible when I was 14. Mm -hmm. So I would have to get up at five in the morning to make it to school by 8 a.m. Oh, I had, wow. a, yeah, I was on North Brooklyn and I, I had to go all the way to Coney Island for school. So it was oh. a long, long travel. <coughs> But the 5 a.m. club, if you mm. follow me on Instagram at GL Rosario, you'll see that I post about the 5 a.m. club all the time. People who get up before everyone else start the day before everyone else, even if they stop the day before everyone else stops the day. But if they started before everyone else, they get that head start. 
So while some people waking up and getting out of bed and going to take a shower, I've already sent out 10 emails. I've worked out, I've meditated, I've prayed. I've done all my things because I get up at five. Mm. So that's a, that's a big one for us. And number two is, this is, this is a, a real thing. Always look for people to hold you accountable, mm. but hold yourself accountable as well. If I write something down and I don't complete it, I share my, my goals with my accountability partner, Luis Lopez. He's mm. tough. <laughs> so, did I say that yet? <laughs> I feel like I need to meet this person. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, you have to meet Louis. He's, he's, he's a character. All of his own, awesome. Which is why we make great partners, because I'm not organized and he is. Right. So, but get yourself an accountability partner. Don't take it personal. Your accountability partner is there to w- help you work through what you're not strong with mm-hmm. and work through those things. Put yourself out there, share your goals with someone and really hold yourself accountable. Um, so that's, that's part of my ritual is just accountability partner and getting up before the rest of the world. I love it. I'm a morning yeah. person. Anyway, I'm even more energetic in the morning than I am right now. Oh, and wow. It's, it's crazy. I get up at five. People hate me. I get up on vacation, <laughs> vacation time. And I'm getting up at five going for a run and they're like, you're on uh, vacation. I love yeah. it. Morning, mornings, mornings, they're key. Yeah. 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 I'm, I'm actually a little jealous. I'm really trying to train myself because a lot of successful people, that's, that's key is they get up very early. Every once yes. in a while, I'll find someone who's like, no, I get up at nine. I'm like, oh, you know, uh-huh. <laughs> you're <laughs> I, like I an alien. Like, I don't know. You know, it's so rare that. I, I got up. If I get up after 5 a.m., for some reason, I feel tired throughout the day. Mm. I don't feel as productive. And I feel like I just can't catch up. Mm. So it's just that 5 a.m. thing. And, and I'm. I've perfected it to the way where my phone goes off and my eyes are already open. Mm. So even on vacation, oh, wow. uh, it's, it's just your body becomes accustomed to it. But you're right. That, that getting up early is very important. And if you join the 5 a.m. club, it's a real hashtag, by the way. Okay, I'll Follow look the for hashtag. It. I will. I hashtag will. <laughs> 5 a.m. club with okay. another five, though. You'll okay. see how many people are actually doing this, and they're all top producers in whatever industry they're in. So there's some truth to it. Yeah, you know? yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm totally looking that up. And then I'm going to have to start getting up at 5 a.m. So I feel worthy of following. <laughs> so, okay. Well, I'm going to do a rapid fire. Okay. So okay. I have all these things. I'm always just really curious about what's working, what people use. If you feel like it's just too secret and you want to pass, you can pass. So, um, but I'm just going to name things off and then you tell me your favorite tool person or whatever response is appropriate. Okay. You ready? Okay. 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 Uh, time blocking. Uh, <laughs> Do you time? <laughs> no. Okay. <laughs> I time block. Ask. I time block only in the morning. And okay. I time block again from five until seven thirty when I leave the house. Mm-hmm. That's that's the real time block. Accountability partner. Lewis is big on time blocking, and believe it or not, until about a month ago, I was never a Google Calendar type of guy, and he's forcing me to use Google Calendar. And guess okay. what? I will admit it's working. <laughs> it's Yay! awesome. So, yeah. It's, I, he put, he actually put, he told me, put this board right next to you, write down your, your the things that you're going to do today, scratch each one off, but also have everything in your calendar. Okay. And that combination is working. Organized. Very good. He's good. <laughs> so, so you have a whiteboard then and Google yes. Calendar. Okay. Yes, so that's your have, system. Yes. And okay. it works. Favorite technology? Um, oh God, my cell phone. Okay. <laughs> Seriously. Just, just simply uh, people, people want to get all these fancy things and all these fancy tools. You're paying a bill for this thing every month. I don't care if you're an Android or iPhone person, I'm Android, but I don't care what you <laughs> use. Get on your phone. You're paying a, a bill to whoever, whatever company you're with. Use it. And if you don't like calls, like me, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> then use it to shoot a video. Use it to talk to video. Use it to shoot videos and share them. Share posts. Talk to people. This is an office. Yeah. This is a, a, such a game changer. And people, some people are ignoring it. They just have a cell phone because it's the newest cell phone, but they're not really using it. Right, so, right. Yeah. I know it was a little bit funny for someone who said that you hate 
calling, but yet you're uh-huh. your favorite technology. Yeah. So hey, listen, yeah. I can do my email, all my social yeah. media. <laughs> I I do I do uh, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, everything on my phone. The only one I haven't gotten into is Snapchat. Uh, my kids keep telling me I need to get into it. <laughs> I just can't. I'm trying. I'm sorry, Snapchat, if you're listening. I'm trying. But yeah, yeah, yeah. All yeah. the other social medias I use on my phone, and it really does work. And shoot video. Shoot my video. my daughter is an an agent in LA, and so and she actually is a part of our team. Like she helps. Uh, she's my assistant when I go down there, and um, and I'm always asking her, "Is Snapchat done yet? Like, is it over? Like, has <laughs> everyone left it? Right? Do I have to like embrace it, or because I've done it a few times and I've tried to incorporate it in marketing, and I'm like, this, is a, this is a one-on-one thing. Like, this is a one. So if you look at it kind of as a onesie twosie, whereas we're so used to like, how can I? But it really, if we're talking relationships, it really makes the most sense when it talk. Mm-hmm. You know, when you're talking mm-hmm. relationship building. But yeah, no, I'm I'm with you. But I'm you know I've definitely you said, my, you said your daughter. I'm interviewing you now. Okay, you said yeah. your daughter's an agent. Yes. She's an agent really? in LA. Yeah, West Hollywood. Wow. Yeah. I would have never thought. So yeah, we, we're it's actually... It's not a pickup line. I'm just no, letting you know. No, I would have we, never uh, thought you have a daughter that can be an agent. I actually have two grandbabies too, so... <laughs> I wow, know. that's I know. awesome. I know, exactly. So we're in the grandparent club, but... <laughs> yes, that's awesome. Isn't it great? It's the best you thing know, ever. <laughs> spoil them, spoil them and give them back. It's yeah. The- <laughs> They're, and we're already training them for real estate. So they'll be oh, yeah. like the fifth generation, I think. <laughs> But well, uh, most of the well, Lewis and I are both parents, and our kids will come into the office, and they're they're just little presidents of the office. They just yes. walk in, hey, hello, everybody. They know everyone's name. <laughs> this is how you train them from now. Let them yeah. go out there and talk to people. So yeah, yeah. it's a hundred percent lifestyle. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so back to our quick fire. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so much. <laughs> no, it always it's always like this, but um, but it's I do love hearing the tools and like what what's current, um, for people, but CRM conversion, conversion, sales pipeline management, Uh, partners, (laughs) partners, someone, someone that is uh, there to actually help you. Oh, uh, got you. I'm the artist. I'm not organized. (laughs) I'm not the organized person. Whatever my partner uses. (laughs) Listen, if you, if you find a, even if it's an assistant, find someone that help will help you manage that. Right, right. That's how I do that. (laughs) Transaction management. Um, Wow, that's a tough one. There's so many. Depends on the transaction. Oh, (laughs) it's it's true. Depends on the transaction. I mean, again, you use multiple yes um, Yes. platforms. Okay. Yes, we do. Um, It really does. I will tell you. Some some people just there have been deals where no one opens up an email and we're doing everything just simply on text. Mm. So it really does depend on the deal, especially here in New York, where it's so diverse, so many different people with different personalities. Mm-hmm. You play it by ear. You you look at the deal. Meet them where they're at kind of an yeah, approach. Yeah. So. Empathy. Empathy. Yeah. You have to work with them, not you. That's yeah. right. That's right. Oh, favorite book? Ooh. Right, right the um, second. Like, I know that it probably, like, if you're like me, it changes like every five minutes. No, and I'll say like, oh, this is the best book ever. And my assistant was like, you say that about every book. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's true. Because we, again, we read so much. Um, one of the first books that got me into thinking about business was Rich Dad, Poor Dad mm. and Think and Grow Rich. Those were two amazing books uh, and a great book outside of business, but inside relationships is All Quiet on the Western Front. Oh, you have okay. to look it up. Okay, what a yeah, great book! I've heard of it. Yeah, what a great book. It's enemies, enemies putting their differences together. I mean, the difference aside to Come enjoy to a moment together. Nice. Trust me. Read the book. <laughs> so, who do you consider your mentor? Oh, uh, my grandmother, okay. my mother. Those two, obviously. Uh, I'm my mama's boy. I will say it again. <laughs> <laughs> At 46, um, George Namnum. It's a strange name, N-A-M-N-U-M, Nam Nam. He's a very good person who taught me a lot about how to make sales more personal. Mm. Uh, So, yeah, great guy. Um, And, of course, there's all those people that you follow online, believe it or not. They become mentors. They become people that are changing your life. Mel Robbins' five-second rule. 
Oh my God, I love Mel. She is amazing. She tells you stop living with fear and just go for it. Stop. Put your feet on the ground and go and do it. And, and she's awesome. Mel Robbins, look her up. Five okay, I will. Rule. I will. I what? will. What's the five second rule? Like well, in that's a her book. I mean, uh, is there like uh, okay. a, because I've heard about like the five second pity party, then it's over. <laughs> like, <laughs> like you can no. mourn for five, oh, like is this is, or, this or is, is completely different. Five okay. second rule, five second rule is if you have an, an impulse to do something, if you don't react to it, if you don't act on it, if you don't take action within five seconds, you're probably going to overthink it and not do it. Oh. And she says, and that's for everything in your life. Just go for it. Don't worry about being judged. Don't worry about failing. Failing is just teaches you lessons. So you need to fail a lot. Yeah. Um, but she says, just go for it. Do, you know, and she started because I love Mel. She was depressed. She was going through issues with her marriage and her business and they were in debt and all these things. And one day she thought of NASA and, you know, the way five, four, three, two, one, and boom, action takes place. And she says, okay, from now on, when I open my eyes in the morning, um, before I count down to one, five, four, three, two, one, my feet are going to be on the floor and my, I'm going to start my day. And it changed her life. She's a speaker. Uh, she has her own podcasts. She is amazing. She's got that book, Five Second Rule. Look her up. Mel, if you're listening to this, I absolutely love you. <laughs> so, we'll have I, to have, sure to I have a celebrity. I have a celebrity crush on Mel, okay. <laughs> brain crush on Mel. She's awesome. That's very cool. Okay, well, I'm going to go ahead and wrap this up with my favorite question of the day. And I have um, all my podcast episodes, I always end with this because I am a huge foodie. Like, I love food. And <laughs> I think it's, it's just, we love, you know, I just love it. Everything about it. I could go on about it. Um, books mm -hmm. and food, like my favorite things. Oh, yeah. There um, you go. And so, what is your favorite dish and where do you get it? And it could be a restaurant. Typically, okay. I'm, I'm actually selfishly looking for restaurant tips, but if you have, like, if it's made at home, you can say that too, but. Uh, restaurant would have to be um, steak and eggs with French fries. It's a horrible breakfast, but it's so good. <laughs> <laughs> it's my comfort food and I get it actually a few blocks. I'm pointing like as if you can actually look. <laughs> I get it a few blocks down at New York Grill in Glendale, Queens. Um, nice people. And excellent, excellent prices and really good steak and eggs. Um, so that's restaurant food, unhealthy food. Other than <laughs> that, you may not believe it, but I'm a huge fan of Greek yogurt. Oh, I love it. That's so you can different. mix that with just about anything in the world, and it's like, ah, it's just I don't care what it is. And rum raisin <laughs> and ice cream. Okay. <laughs> I went health, I went unhealthy, healthy, unhealthy. That's rum yeah. That, that's what that's balance. That's balance. <laughs> yeah, there you go. It's listen. You have to have some fun in life. You know, if if eating super super healthy is only going to extend my life five minutes, take them. <laughs> I'm okay. I, I want some rum raisin ice cream once in a while. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, is there anything <laughs> else that I haven't asked that maybe I should have, or is there anything else that you'd like to share before we wrap? Uh, no, I mean, keep contacting people. This is fun. Okay. And good. you're good at it. <laughs> Thank you. You're really good at it's, this. This is fun. You know, I say books and food are my favorite things, but really doing like interviewing really awesome people is really my favorite thing. And, and so. the cool thing about that, because I do it, we do it here too. Yeah. It's just actually learning, picking up little golden nuggets from people. Yeah. Isn't, that, isn't that amazing? Like just having a conversation, you pick up so much. Yeah. So yeah, keep doing this. This is okay. great. You're so thank good at you. it. Thank you so much. Well, thank yeah. you again for being a guest here. I just really appreciate uh, it. And I do feel like you've given some really great takeaways in a lot of different areas. So um, thank you so much to everyone for listening. Thank you, Taylor, who is um, right now listening, making sure everything's going well and uh, picking things up when they aren't. I just really appreciate you. So, and thanks to everyone who's listening. Remember the best is yet to come.